Michael, last time we talked, it was October. You were just finishing The Choice. And you said, I remember very distinctly, that Donald Trump may be many things, but he is surely the product of a revolution that has been brewed by Sarah Palin and the Tea Party. Exactly right. That's what, uh, when we started to build the film, uh, Divided States of America, we, we watched a lot of the footage of Sarah Palin and a lot of the code words that you hear from Trump were, I think, started then. You hear her say, the elites in Washington with great disdain. You, uh, she uh, regularly works into her speech that she read the New York Times that morning and everybody boos lustily for uh, 30 or 40 seconds. She uh, uses the, the media as a foil uh, all early uh, harbingers of what Trump would watch and uh, and begin to copy, certainly part of what all the Tea Party candidates that ran, especially in the 2010 midterm elections, the, the vocabulary is the vocabulary of Sarah Palin. So Donald Trump is not someone who blustered by sheer uh, uh, performance of his personality into becoming the nominee and president of the United States. He is an establishment Republican now? Is that the establishment? No, no Donald Trump won the election uh, uh, and is uh, in going as a president who uh, participated or led a hostile takeover of the Republican Party. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily a Republican uh, party that he wanted to run as Republicans. Uh, in fact, uh, one of his uh, closest political gurus, uh, Roger Stone, told us that tr it didn't matter to Trump what party it was. It would happen to be the Republicans because they were a convenient platform for him. But that actually what he was trying to do was, uh, was uh, be an anti-establishment, anti-Washington, break the place down kind of a guy. And, uh, and he learned that by watching Palin, by watching the Tea Party, listening to thousands of hours of uh, right-wing and conservative talk radio and formulating a series of policies and approaches that were absolutely contrarian. They were not about the Republican Party. And the first thing, of course, he had to do was beat the establishment, the Republican establishment, the, the Jeb Bush uh, uh, and all of the others who everybody said was the greatest. Uh, there were 16 others he had to beat, and uh, the Republican elders had all said this was the greatest group they'd ever had running for the presidency, and he knew he had to knock them off by being outrageous and anti-Republican in what he did. So now he heads into um, office, and talk about division. It certainly seems like he is going to uh, uh, face uh, a challenge that has faced many other people who thought they were going to change Washington. So talk about division now. I see a, a big challenge for him and the possibility of greater divisions and uh, greater dysfunction. It, it, it's hard to imagine greater division or greater dysfunction, but you might be right. We'll, we'll soon see. Some of that will depend on whether the Democrats can do what we watched the Republicans do to Barack Obama. The Republicans, almost from the very beginning, decided to get together and essentially just say no. It's a little stark to say they said they were going to say no to everything, but they essentially said no, they were not going to cooperate or they were going to slow walk uh, Obama's initiatives. It, it will be interesting to see whether the Democrats already divided themselves in a way the way the Republicans were when Obama started. Uh, uh, divided because of the Bernie Sanders people, divided around other issues that uh, Democrats need to coalesce around before they can take on Trump. And it sort of depends on how cantankerous and anti-establishment, including anti-democratic establishment, Trump decides to be. We, we don't really know, but the, the interesting thing about covering national American politics is I know one thing and so do you, and that is that a week from now we're going to know. Well, Donald Trump is not really an ideologue, though, is he? So, uh, again, talking about a house divided and the, and the possible divisions that could happen uh, between the administration and even his own party and his Republican Congress, there seems to be great potential for greater divisions there. Well, it, as I say, some of it has to do with what he takes on. Uh, one of the things we know is that Obama, what, what they call Obamacare, uh, is under uh, fire right now and being dismantled 
Trump uh, recently uh, indicated that there was still going to be some kind of national health care policy, uh, which I think lit some, uh, uh, or at least got the attention of some of the people who thought they were electing a different kind of person. We're, we're going to see. The, the fact is, a lot of what he does and what he's tended to do, and look at his cabinet, uh, look who he's chosen, he's, uh, he's going to be, he's going the other way on almost everything if he can. Uh, I don't think he knows what that means, and I don't think the Congress yet knows what that means, or even his own cabinet knows what that means. It may be that he leaves an awful lot of governing to uh, the others that he's chosen for his cabinet and acts as a transactional president. There have been a few of those that reach out and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with this issue. I'm going to get in a room and work out that deal because that is linchpin here, and the rest of it he sort of lets other people handle. So... Who is the silent majority here now in our divided states of America, if there is one? Well, there always was uh, Spiro Agnew's uh, silent majority uh, back in the Nixon administration even. They became uh, uh, what were called Reagan Democrats. Uh, they've, they've been uh, people who are increasingly uh, uh, disenfranchised and angry and feel betrayed by the government as a result of both policies like globalization, the natural evolution of the economy to a more tech-oriented uh, way of uh, places to work, uh, the, the absolute crash of the economy in 2008 uh, made a lot of people who were not kind of paying attention to government angry enough that they got back in the game and uh, they were uh, uh, organized and noticed by uh, Sarah Palin and the Tea Party and would grow to be uh, Trump's natural constituency because he went out and found them. The silent majority is no longer that silent. That all changed in the summer of 2009 around Obamacare and what Obama did or didn't do vis-a-vis -vis regulation uh, and punitive measures at the banks. Uh, after the, uh, you know, when all the bonuses came after we'd thrown hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe trillions of dollars at the banks. Um, there was plenty for people, regular people, people who didn't really care very much about politics in an intense way to suddenly get really involved. Their retirement programs were gone. Their businesses were gone. Their homes were in underwater. Uh, and the government wasn't doing anything about it. The government of Barack, first George W. Bush and then uh, Barack Obama, and they got uh, involved, and here they are now. Are there other silent majorities out there? Absolutely. It's a divided states of America, and they really are waiting out there, I think, to see what Trump does. And if he doesn't do, I think, what they hope he'll do, whatever that is, even if what it is is to break the government, I think we'll hear from them again. Well, that brings to mind the the uh, the bank, the bailout, the uh, remedies that Barack Obama and Tim Geithner applied to the financial crisis, and then the negotiations over the debt ceiling some years later, there was so much anger at the perception of bailing out banks and not uh, punishing bankers so much, uh, which had big political uh, fallout. But I'm in, and you spent a lot of time about this point in divided states of America. But what I'm really intrigued about is we don't really know if there had been a different course, whether the financial system would have been saved or gone down in ruins. So how do we know? We don't know. Um, Barack Obama will never know. He'll, to the extent that he looks back on all of this and says, what could I have done that would have been different? This is one of those big moments. He's only been president two or three months. The nation, according to Tim Geithner and his other financial advisors, is on the edge of the abyss, literally on the edge. Uh, all could, uh, everybody, uh, everybody in America, the whole world could have been in a, in a depression of the magnitude that no one can even fathom. When he's faced with the choice of a lot of angry people out there, the silent majority you and I are talking about, the eventual Tea Party members and Trump supporters, those people, very angry, along with the Wall Street, the anti-Wall Street people, very angry about the fact that this new Democrat who's president, who promised change and transformation, is uh, seems to be uh, uh, cozying up to the banks, giving them billions of dollars, and not really caring about the very people who thought this 
revolutionary moment was about to take place in America. Obama had to face that. He had the political people in his government, David Axelrod uh, and others, uh, arguing very strongly for what they called scalps. Go nationalize Citibank. You know, arrest some of the top officers at Lehman Brothers. Uh, make the average person feel that the government is responsive to them. And Obama chose not to do that, chose to hold hands with the bankers and say, we'll all go into this together because Geithner had convinced him, I don't know how whether he was Geithner was pushing on an open door or not, but had convinced him that uh, we were at a, at a place where if he fooled around with this, uh, all hell was going to break loose. So he chose the banks over, uh, over the people. But we still have a sizable number of people in this country that believe that had there been a completely, if we had not rescued the banks, if we had not done the auto bailout, if we had uh, not uh, met the debt ceiling challenge, everything still would be fine, and they still believe that. Absolutely. That's the people who say, break the government. Don't. They even got mad at their own Tea Party members when they went to Washington after 2010 and didn't stop Obamacare. Of course, they couldn't stop Obamacare. It was already law by then. But they, angry enough, continued to press. And they and that case, especially among economic conservatives and talk radio hosts, one of the most powerful and potent forces, I think, in America that we don't recognize, those of us who live on the coasts or, or live in uh, or, or work in elite institutions, don't recognize the power of those voices in uh, in bringing people along on a political argument that uh, we sort of completely don't understand. Obamacare became that focus for them, and so did uh, so did the bonuses for the bankers and and what was happening with the banks in this country. I, I think um, by the summer of 2009, it was a fundamental problem in America, and Obama and his staff suddenly realized in August of 2009. Uh, when Congress went home for the recess, that, oh my God, we're losing the Congress. There's anger out there. And a lot of it, some of it, is even racially motivated. And uh, I don't think they were ready for any of that. Well, I live in Seattle. You live in Boston. And we're on the left and right coasts of the country, which are very different than the heartland and very different than even some of the, the bigger cities in the country. Is I think that one of the unique um, uh, features of this political age is so much very important and national policy comes out of cities. What do you think um, in this divide that we have, the relationship of the, the administration is going to be to some of these um, progressive and liberal cities and states? I uh, grew up in Idaho, so I have a kind of sense of the rural-urban divide in this country. Um, my family all still lives there. My brothers, uh, er, er, everybody, every time I go back, I'm not, I was not surprised by the Trump vote. I was not surprised by the feeling out there in the country that uh, elite institutions, big cities, big corporations, uh, big media uh, do not have the best interests uh, uh, of the people out there in the vast middle of America and in the suburbs of the big cities in America. They don't have their their uh, best interests at heart, or at least they don't understand them. It will be a fascinating thing to see whether Trump can corral and hold on to that uh, 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 support. It, obviously, I mean, I've just finished a film Friday that will air next Tuesday called uh, uh, Trump's Road to the White House, uh, following uh, exactly what he did to win. And, uh, and I know from talking to the top seven people in his campaign as uh, as it was happening, that uh, he really, when he went into those Clinton blue wall states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, in the last year, after the WikiLeaks of John Podesta's emails, she was already teetering. What did he do? He went into those towns where there are no, all over Michigan and Wisconsin, where there are the shells of factories. And, uh, and, uh, and nothing working. And, but there was one thing that was, somebody in our film said there was one thing that was there, and that was Trump signs everywhere. And he's going to have to hold on to them. They elected him president of the United States. They put him over the top. And now he's going to have to figure out what he can do in policy terms, uh, more than just break the government, uh, to, to hold on to them. Doesn't that, doesn't that 
mean that mean Trump, that Trump, yeah, Trump has to Trump be the ideologue, ideologue, not just the personality. Not just the personality. I'm not sure. It may be. It may be. This is what they're counting on. When I talk to the people out there, um, it's a little bit like uh, it's almost like they they knew what they were going to get with Clinton, and it was maybe going to be a little boring, and maybe going to be a little business as usual, and maybe going to be the next extension of Obama's diversity politics, and maybe they didn't want any of that. Maybe they wanted one important thing, and that was a job. And I think they're betting that a businessman in a room with the door closed and people he can do a deal with, a la The Apprentice, the way he was on The Apprentice, that maybe that man, that personality, who's a billionaire and doesn't care whether people like him or whether he gets a job after it's all over or not, I think their calculation is maybe this guy uh, can go in a room and close the door and cut a deal and I'll have a job. Companies will come back. Uh, even the Democrats will play along because we, we the middle of America, the silent majority, whatever you, you and I want to try to call it, uh, we are a force and we, uh, and we can harm any politician who doesn't, uh, who doesn't do uh, the will of the people as, as we define it. Well, that brings to mind another snake pit that uh, Trump might be Trump might crawling be into, and that, into and that is, we've seen this before, seen this before. The, idea the idea of reducing, of reducing taxes, taxes and spending and a lot more, more, money more money on the military, on the military on a trillion, trillion dollar trillion infrastructure, infrastructure project. project. Uh, we know what happened, uh, we know with, what Reagan. happened with Reagan. Does that seem, to be, that dangerous? seem to be dangerous? Well, it certainly is what uh, ate uh, George W. Bush alive. Uh, the of the anti, the, the real destruction of the Republican Party began uh, from the people I've talked to back in the Bush administration when what he called compassionate conservatism actually ran into deficit uh, uh, building and uh, two wars. Uh, I think uh, uh, they were very angry. A lot of economic conservatives in talk show radio hosts were very, very angry at uh, Bush at the time uh, uh, that he didn't get a handle on government. This goes back to the, the Reagan lesson that you've alluded to. It, it, it is absolutely something if you're the people around uh, uh, Donald Trump that you're going to be putting your ear to the ground and listening carefully to about deficits versus uh, expenditures. And I, I mean, uh, tax, uh, uh, lowering the taxes. And I don't, I mean, this is, these are, there are so many unknowns about him, partly because he's never done any of this before. He's an absolute political novice, a reality TV star and a political novice and an entrepreneur. There's, and there's certainly not anything about his business successes that would indicate that he's good at, uh, the management of, uh, of things, but he's a, uh, he's a, he's a deal maker and he's a, and he's a salesman. And, uh, if there's one thing that we learned from our film, the choice back in uh, October, it is that he's the sort of PT Barnum of a lot of, uh, a lot of these kind of things The and, 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 and maybe, maybe that's what's required. Maybe selling the idea to companies, corporations, China, Russia, and others is what's required. It'll be the first time it's ever happened. Uh, it seems like a moonshot to a lot of people I talk to who are conventional reporters and uh, political observers. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't, I mean, it's just the, the, the victory seemed like such a surprise to so many people. It's uh, including to Trump, I think. It's, uh, it's completely possible. It's something none of us really know yet uh, is, is, as they say, possible. Uh, certainly one of the things that I'm dedicated to is continuing to watch it as closely as I can over the years, and uh, and uh, you'll be among the first to know, Stephen. Well, we, well we, you and I are you and I roughly are the same age, I think, same generation, generation. And, I think and I think we look, we at, look at politics, at politics, at politics through, through a traditional, traditional uh, lens. Uh, lens. What, to what degree to what did technology, degree technology social, media social media have, have to do with to do Trump's, Trump's success? success. And, and what would Trump, what would Trump be, without be without Twitter? Twitter. Well, Trump is uh, using Twitter. And this is my observation now, but I've also talked to a lot of people about it. Trump is using Twitter not to talk to his voters, but to talk to the press. He has decided to deal with us in the technological equivalent of the way Ronald Reagan decided to deal with the press, which was kind of jump over our heads and go straight to the people on television. 
Uh, it drove people like Dan Rather and Sam Donaldson crazy in those days. And it will, uh, uh, using Twitter as the, as the means of communicating with the press, will drive everybody in the press crazy now. And it is, and it has been all through the campaign. Because what happens is, he'll start an issue, Russia on Thursday. Friday, there's a back, there's a backwash. Saturday, that issue's changed and we've gone to something else. So for reporters who want to dig in and find out what were the facts of that assertion, what is the fake news, what is the real news, it starts to get very complicated uh, very fast. But that's a strategy that uh, Donald Trump is using. Uh, and for a lot of people, I mean, I'm fortunate, I get to take the long view of many things, but for people who have jobs uh, banging away at it every day, this is a formidable challenge. He's, uh, his staff, this is the most amazing thing to me of all the presidents I've ever covered, and I, I go back to Jimmy Carter. He's, he's Mr. Trump to everybody, and now it's gonna be Mr. President. But everybody, when they talk about him, the people closest to him and the most powerful people there, uh, I've never spoken to Steve Bannon, but everybody else we've talked to, and they all still call him Mr. Trump. So he's the center of the, the, the you know, the hub uh, of all the spokes on all the, all the directions his government and his people will go. So he's going to use uh, Twitter to uh, talk to us. And he's going to use, um, I think, group mass rallies, arenas, get togethers uh, uh, to deal with the people and keep them on his side. And he's going to be a salesman in chief, in effect. And I think uh, in terms of how Washington goes down, it's too early to tell how he deals with people. But my guess would be he's going to try to get in the room with a few people and, and cut some deals. What do you think his relationship with the White House press corps is going to be like given the last, last few, days. few days? It's not going to be good. It, it, it's almost never good with a president. Uh, uh, let's While we wave goodbye to... Barack Obama in the rearview mirror. Let's remember that he was the hardest president on leakers, uh, did more to stop investigative reporting in, inside his government, inside the national security apparatus. I made a big film called United States of Secrets about people who got hammered by the Obama administration, you know, people who would be heroes, like Daniel Ellsberg style heroes. So the Obama administration, and, and he personally, very tough on the idea of that, and very hard, to, uh, very determined to control the press, like all presidents are. Bush, I thought Bush was bad. Obama was harder. The Bush administration, of course, under Cheney, was unbelievably hard. And uh, there hasn't really been uh, an administration that said, oh, I'm going to embrace the press and get along with them, and it's all going to be uh, uh, strawberries and you know cream. It's not that at all. They... This is not our job to get along with them, and it's not their job to get along with us. We have to try to get information from them and this particular group of people. It's a little early to say now, but uh, but it looks like it's going to be a rocky road. Well, is well, I was is, referring, I was especially referring especially to the White House press, White House press people, people, which are which public, are public uh, and televised. And televised. Uh, yeah. and, um, the fact that the fact Donald Trump that may, Trump be, may be uh, um, using, this, using that, that that uh, a venue uh, as a way to send other signals. Well, absolutely, and I and I, you know, listen. The 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 moment with Jim Acosta, uh, the CNN reporter, where he basically said, "I'm not going to answer mm -hmm. those questions." Mm -hmm. That's uh, there's two ways the national press can handle that. If I, I like to think, if I was in, in that room at that time, I would have stood up and done a uh, "I am Spartacus" moment, where I said, <laughs> "I'll ask Acosta's question for him," and when I go down. The next person will stand up and ask Acosta's a question for him, um, and then we'd see what what the new uh, newly elected president of the United States would would do. Uh, I think I think the, the the press, the good parts of the press, the what we call the what I like to call the substantive press, uh, that press hopefully will uh, stay the course, do what we've always done, uh, adapt to the techniques, but continue the the job of, uh, of, uh, of digging in. The, the, the problem, of course, is there's so many bubbles of information, other places where people can go and other places where the President of the United States can uh, 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 bestow a favor to roll an issue out. Um, it's much different than it was even four years ago, five years ago. But we're going to have to sort that out inside the press business. Um, hopefully, maybe even truly a place like 
public media where there are a lot of foot soldiers who don't aren't beholden to anybody, including a, an economic imperative, um, you, me, all of us can realize that this is a, this is a, a new day for us, and we have to we have to hold that standard uh, high and uh, and be a place where people can can trust uh, the kind of information they get. Yes, the difference in this divide. Um, have um, to do with the and, 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 and uh, uh, the rise of the energy, energy in Black Lives, in Black Lives Matter, Matter movement and the examination of the of what they do. I think that makes this a different divide from um, any time in the, time in the since the 60s, certainly. We spent uh, five scenes inside the Divided States of America films uh, going into Trayvon Martin Ferguson, the, what was called the Beer Summit with Skip Gates. Um, certainly the Charlestown uh, murders, uh, because of the unique place that Barack Obama uh, sits or stands in the middle of all of those issues as the first African-American president. Uh, we talked to people who talked to him regularly during that time uh, as he tried to decide where he was on that careful tightrope uh, the black president had to walk in all of those controversial issues. Um, and the emergence through uh, critical moments where uh, race really did enter in from back to the birther movement all the way along. It, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating special part of the division inside America. I think many, many, many white people uh, thought when Obama was elected, okay, we can uh, wipe our hands clean of race now. This proves we're not a racially divided uh, country. It seems uh, that uh, uh, the people we talk to, especially African-American scholars and friends of his, uh, who say uh, even he recognizes that in some ways, because he was the first black president and because of who he is uniquely as a person, um, uh, uh, careful, cautious, thoughtful, professoral almost about some of these issues, not emotional, or resisting being emotional, that maybe the issues got even worse under the presidency of uh, Barack Obama than they, they were or ever have been before. It's too early really to tell about an assertion like that, but it certainly seems, uh, and, and watching the arc of him from the beer summit with Skip Gates to singing Amazing Grace in Charleston, which is truly one of the great moments in his presidency, I think, uh, watching how far he traveled on that issue over the eight years it is, I think, a fascinating and additionally important uh, part of the film, if I do say so myself. Do you think, though, so, that um, yeah. one of the differences in this divide is the renewed energy um, that's going into um, racial, injustice racial injustice and an examination, and an examination of, white of white supremacy? We'll see. We'll see. Um, it's, it, you know, we'll see. Sometimes events control these things. Um, and, and, and President Trump, when he's President Trump, uh, will uh, clearly affect the response by what he does if something, if there's something important that happens. I mean, what we already know from the Black Lives Matter mov movement in the post-Ferguson days is and all Lives Matter movement grew up as well with equal vehemence an equal uh, uh, um, distrust. Uh, you know, we're, a, we're, it's the most open wound, I think, in our society. Uh, almost everybody I talk to in Washington, uh, certainly everybody in the Obama administration, and many people going into the Trump administration will agree that this is, a, this is a wound Americans haven't solved yet, haven't come close to, to closing. And, uh, um, it's the one I worry the most about in, in some ways because it can so directly affect, uh, you know, innocent bystanders in lots of ways. Policy is, policy arguments are policy arguments, but when they come down to military decisions, when they come down to big economic decisions, and when they come down to quality of life issues and then race, they're all in that big bag, the one you worry a lot about. Well, again, well, thank, again you, thank you, Michael. Another fantastic documentary from the year. I'll be looking forward to Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Uh, Rosalind uh, Rose 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 Rose
Thank you, Steve. Best of luck to you. Always good to talk to you, my friend.